Public Affairs, Science, Technology, and Environment. My name is Marco Bonabello, and I will facilitate today's online meeting from <coughs> Vienna, while our chair, Ms. Doris Barnett, will be leading us from the session from Berlin in Germany and chairing the session. Uh, just a couple of usual technical announcements before we officially start. So, as you know, this meeting is recorded and broadcasted live on the OACPA media, social media platforms and website. Uh, simultaneous interpretation into all six OAC official languages will be provided via the Zoom platform. You can choose the language of interpretation at the bottom of your screen. Kindly note that uh, an advanced list of speakers for each agenda item has been duly received from the virtual desk office. Considering the high number of registration, almost 25, the speaker list will be open now only for the next 30 minutes. Uh, if interested, please use the chat function to register for either of the two debates. Uh, to ensure, after that, it will close. To ensure most experience, I kindly ask all participants to mute their microphone when not speaking. Likewise, please unmute your microphone only when given the floor. I kindly ask also speakers to limit their intervention to two minutes during the debates thereby enabling a sound exchange of ideas and a timely conclusion of our meeting by 15.30 Central European time sharp due to the subsequent session of our third committee. Um, finally, please turn on your video when uh, given the floor. Uh, otherwise, we encourage people to keep their cameras off. Without further delay, I will now pass the floor to Ms. Doris Barnett, chairperson of the OSCPA General Committee on Economic Affairs, Science, Technology and Environment. Doris, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, dear Marco, and uh, welcome to all of you who joined us, uh, who join us today for um, Marco, for your introductory and for helping me run through this session rem um, remotely. The draft again agenda of this meeting has been circulated. As we heard no objections, it shall be considered as um, and adopted. The um, ag agenda is adopted. Thank you. Now let me come to my opening remarks. Dear Mr. President, dear Secretary General, esteemed colleagues, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's meeting of the OSCE PA General Committee on Economic Affairs, Science, Technology and Environment, which for the first time ever will be conducted over the web due to health crisis. Today, we will be hearing from Mrs. Elena Hotcha, who, as rapporteur of the committee, will elaborate on our recent work and highlighted areas of focus for this year's report. We will also carefully listen to our dear OSCE colleagues, Ambassador Florian Raunig, Chairperson of the Economic and Environmental Committee and Permanent Representative of Austria to the OSCE, and Ambassador Zukic, who uh, coordinator of the OECE economic and environmental activities. Their presentations will feed into today's debate on the work of the OECE and of the OECE PA in building economic and environmental security amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, COVID-19 has been deeply impacting our lives in a multi multitude of ways, as well as, as our work as illustrated today by us gathering online rather than through a long awaited and much desired meeting in person. I'm glad to see your eagerness and remain engaged within the, our, our PA despite everything. We, the vice chair, the rapporteur of the committee and I have agreed that we could not let ourselves be discouraged by the challenges and, um, encountered and that we had to explore ad, avenues to find the pandemic and its numerous effects, effects both immediate and long-term on our societies, economies and environment. Therefore, we welcome the initiative of the, interna of the International Secretariat back in early 2020 to hold a series of thematic parliamentary web dialogues on the multidimensional security implications of the ongoing crisis. In, in particular, the webinar called the, uh, the Economic Security Fallout of the COVID-19 Pandemic and 
COVID-19 a turning point for environmental protection, facilitated an open exchange of views with renowned experts and key topics of our community, uh, community committee's agenda. I believe Elena will elaborate further on these timely policy debates. Allow me just to stress that the nature of, this, um, of the disease and its transmission mechanics have brought into the spotlight its potential interlinkage with environmental degradation and the per per pervasive impact of air pollution on human security. Appallingly, most of the pre-exciting ex existing conditions that increase the risk of hospitalization and death among COVID-19 patients are the same diseases caused by short and long-term exposure to sustained pollution. It is widely known that pollution is bad for our health, but what did we not know is the scale of the problem. According to recent studies published in the Journal of Environmental Research, exposure to particular matter from fossil fuel emissions only accounted for 18% um, of total global death amongst, that means all, almost one in five in 2018. I repeat, one in five deaths globally is directly linked to breathing polluted air. If this is shocking data and, and if it's correct, we are facing a global emergency security crisis that requires our immediate attention and action in all of our countries. Therefore, I welcome the return of the US of the United States to the Paris Climate Agreement. agreement. In October last year, we also had the chance to be briefed by the Italian Society of Environmental Medicine, CIMA, about their important scientific work on the alleged correlation between COVID-19 virus transmission and the concentration of atmospheric particulated matter. As the result, we have shared this knowledge through an open letter circulated to all OSCE PA delegations in November 2020 and invited you to consider this information in your policymaking efforts aimed at mitigating the impact of the pandemic. To further this effort, efforts, I'm glad to announce that our committee is planning a follow-up follow uh, exchange with leading research centers across the OSCE region, including the Max Planck Institute from Germany, to learn more about these linkages and further promote our science-based policymaking. I'm happy to invite you to this event tentatively planned for spring and looking forward to your active con contribution and participation. This hor horrific health crisis has shown us that we must embrace a holistic and interdisciplinary approach and environmental security to our um, environmental security, whereby the protection of the environment, including our precious climate, becomes the precondition to ensure the people's and planet's good health. At this critical uh, juncture, I'm especially convinced that policymakers should respond to citizens' security needs through timely and well calibrated environmental protection policies based on the latest scientific evidence. Against this backdrop, we must underline that vital role of national parliament parliaments in ensuring scrutiny of governmental activity and promoting inclusive green recovery measures. In addition, the pandemic has made it utterly clear, it's utterly clear that we must act as a global community to successfully respond to global challenges. Nationalistic, individualistic and isolationistic responses only accelerate the problem. Therefore, we must also strengthen our cooperation on the economic, technological and scientific front. I'm firm, I firmly believe that enhanced international cooperation is the only way to effectively address the COVID-19 pandemic 
and build a safer future for our citizens, our economies, our well-being. To this end, all our countries benefit from working together in advancing technology and science. The development of COVID-19 vaccines, for example, should have never been possible at such speed if all countries had not realized the state of at, pay, at play, pulling together resources and critical scientific data to find a common solution to a global problem. The same logic should be applied to other uh, global challenges such as environmental degradation and global warming. Only by sharing our knowledge and by acting together, we can hope to mitigate and hopefully overcome such threats. Ultimately, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed how human vul vulnerabilities are highly determined by socioeconomic factors and how socioeconomic inequalities impact our citizens resilience to such scru uh, scrutiny threats. COVID-19 highlighted a vicious circle. Unsustainable development leads to environmental degradation, which will lead to new pandemic threats, which will lead to lockdowns, economic slow, uh, sh slowdowns and job losses. Hence, what we need is a social vaccine just as much as a medical vaccine. Nobody should be denied the benefits of economic growth and industrialization as long as they are striving to full res respect the environmental uh, environment and the planet. It is high time we re redirect our efforts toward building a truly sustainable model of economic development in response to growing public health concerns as well as the security expectations of current and future generations. Against this background, I would urge you all to make greater use of interparliamentary platforms such as the OCEPA. It is unique, its uniqueness and added value come from comprehensive understanding of security in which um, economy, economic science, technology, and the environment are integral and fundamental elements. It is our duty to leverage this uniqueness by advocating in our respective countries for a comprehensive approach to security and uh, that encompass environment protection and a more balanced development approach. I strongly believe that the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly and its parliamentarians have a significant role to play in regenerating polit political trust and bringing attention to the important work of our organization. It is by forming a un united front and strengthening our co cooperation that we'll be able to fight the challenges that will come our way. Today it's, it's co uh, COVID-19, tomorrow who knows what it will be. Thank you for your attention and now let me give the word first to my vice chair, Artur Gerasimov, who wants the floor. And after that, to my dear colleague, um, the rapporteur, uh, Elena Hodja. Thank you. Artur, it, the, word, uh, the microphone is on you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, dear Doris, dear colleagues, uh, first of all, I want to say that, yes, all of us understand that now the major, major, uh, issue we need to discuss is our response to the crisis provoked by the COVID-19 pandemic. We should think about the reforms of healthcare systems, accessibility to vaccination of our citizens, support of economics and social support, creating step support funds, tax uh, vacancies, flexible workday, and other important steps, which must be, of course, in our uh, list of plans in case we want to fight with the pandemic, uh, which is now in the air. But also, we don't need to forget about other extremely important issues uh, and uh, global warming, uh, other ecologically related issues, um, issues related with eco economics. And also, I fully support our chairperson, uh, Doris Barnett, 
uh, in that that we need to very carefully continue discuss air pollution issue because I think uh, personally this is one of the very important um, and significant issues related to the COVID-19 pandemic as well. And air pollution refers to the release of pollutants into the air that is detrimental to human health and the planet as a whole. And we should tackle this threat and ask our governments to monitor the situation on air pollution and implement all international instruments on reducing the spread of pollutants. And also, you know, um, COVID-19 pandemic um, shows for all of us that importance of cooperation and importance of communication in the second dimension increased drastically. And I want to say thank you for the leadership of the assembly, for the leadership of second committee and for the international secretariat, uh, because uh, during this time in 2020 and 2021, second committee uh, was working not less effective than in the previous years. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now please, Elena, with your report. Thank you, uh, Chairperson, uh, dear Deputy Chair, dear colleagues, dear Secretary General. COVID-19 has undermined the economy, has turned the lives of billions of people around the globe upside down, and has affected the health, economic, environment, and social domains. It has also underlined the need for coordinated efforts in addressing a multitude of complex interlinked issues for which the international community is required to provide strong and credible responses. We should collectively seize the opportunity and encourage our parliaments to play a pivotal role in forging the new post-COVID-19 world order, an order which will have to effectively address our growing development's needs while fully safeguarding the planet where we live. To find a delicate balance is our current mission and it is what future generations will judge us for. For this, we'll need a strong political leadership and we'll need to put short-sighted partisan national interests aside for the common good of our planet. The OCPA is eager to actively cooperate with OCE chairmanship and the executive structures of the organizations fully in line with their 2021 priorities. While the COVID-19 pandemic is first and foremost a health crisis, leaders and experts around the globe agree that significant policy, economic and social adjustments are urgently required to recover from the ongoing emergency and build resilience against similar future shocks. The public health crisis followed by stringent containment measures pushed both advanced and emerging uh, economies into rations, recessions. In response, many participating states have introduced emergency measures to counter the downward turn of their economies. Notably, our parliaments have also played a key role in passing economic aid packages and emergency public health measures. However, the effectiveness of the healthcare and economic measures require international cooperation and coordination between countries, as well as multilateral organizations. Parliamentarians should therefore make full use of platforms such as OCPA to share best practices and develop common approaches to speed up recovery and prevent future similar crises. We should encourage governments to further stimulate a social economic recovery for financing mitigations measures and targeted public investments, to promote cooperation between countries and within countries to prevent the recession from becoming a long-term depression to ensure scrutiny of governmental activity, prevent abuses of power and promote comprehensive and inclusive recovery measures. Lack of transparency in public institutions and widely perceived corruption in public offices continue to hamper citizens' trust in democratic institutions and processes. Fighting corruption shall remain a top priority across the OC region as it directly impacts participating states' development opportunities and citizens' lives. The work of our representative on fighting corruption, Mr. Karala Bides, to promote a more active engagement of national parliaments in this context is remarkable. However, 
we should continue to promote policy convergence on anti-corruption issues and strengthen political will for the steady implementation of good government's principles at the national level. In this regard, the use of new technology and digitalization offer golden opportunities to promote good governance by enhancing transparency, accountability, accessibility to information. Today, in our region, women are disproportionately exposed to economic vulnerabilities and often lack the security that follows from equal participation in economic life. Supporting women's economic empowerment is a prerequisite for inclusive and equitable economic recovery, which has a clear connection to security. It is critical to advance gender mainstreaming efforts through education and open public dialogue. While borders have closed and countries have gone into isolation, the global COVID-19 pandemic is a stark reminder of the vital importance of international cooperation also in the field of migration. We should encourage and support our governments to promote effective migration management, including through coordination between countries, exchange of best practices, and support from relevant international organizations to meet the challenges of migration, for instance, the Southeastern Europe. The COVID-19 pandemic has also underscored how interconnected is public security with citizens' health, environmental degradation, and climate change. Building on findings of several timely PA initiatives, the leaders of this committee grew determined to address environment security in a more holistic and interdisciplinary way. Better understanding the environment and its interconnectedness with our daily security should become our overarching priority. Like the two sides of the same coin, the climate and public health crisis share similar root causes and both views as looming spoilers to our global security. Over the years, compelling correlation between environment degradation and global security have emerged. Climate change is now widely recognized as a climate crisis. Extreme weather events intense desertification, rapid urbanization processes, land degradation, constantly growing levels of greenhouse emissions, drastic losses in biodiversity and forest cover, ocean acidification, rise of sea levels, climate and pollution driven migration, conflicts for access to clean water and other scarce resources are same of the main security challenges stemming from the radical degradation of our environment, which includes our climate. People all over the world are directly and being affected both individually and as a community. Effects are wide ranging and besides the environment itself, they concern public health, economy, infrastructure, energy resources, and so on. Against this backdrop, COVID-19 has underlined the importance of conserving natural habitats by revisiting our relationship with nature and rebuilding a more environmentally responsible world. Therefore, the need for the well-informed, coherent and stringent environmental mitigation and adaptation strategies and policies is greater than ever before in modern history. In this view, the decision of the new US administration to rejoin the Paris Agreement reiterates the need for concerted global efforts to effectively fight against the climate crisis. The OCPA Special Representative on Arctic Issues, Ms. Aitsheim, uh, wisely centered her mandate on raising awareness on the direct impact of the climate crisis on the Arctic and the overall security of the OC region. I concur with her assessment about the need to further prioritize environmental security within the OCPA agenda and to the extent possible operationalize our parliamentary engagement in this context. I'll do my utmost to make it happen convinced that this is the most urgent accidental threat faced by our civilizations. When it comes to the concrete actions, we should consider to proactively engaging in safeguarding nature, biodiversity and our climate, including by pressuring our governments to ratify and implement relevant international agreements such as COP21, Paris Agreement and other regional arrangements. Furthering cooperation with the OCE and developing a new partnership with relevant international stakeholders to advance our actions. Promoting the exchange of best practices and raising awareness among parliamentarians on the political role on legislative actions 
needed to transition toward environmentally friendly society. Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic underscored more than any time in recent history, how important it is to protect our public health. A positive correlation between exposure to significant levels of air pollution and higher fatality rates has been signaled by various scientific efforts around the globe, emphasized by research work as well. Notably, the Italian Society on, on Environment Medicine innovative research suggests that PM should be regarded as a contributing factor to COVID-19 infections, both in terms of airborne diffusion and health outcomes. To prevent the diffusion of coronavirus under the air pollution conditions, it appears critical to reduce the levels of particulate matters by short term and mid term. In the short term, the temporarily halting vehicular traffic and reducing heating combustion in cities experiences more than two consecutive days of PM incidences and in the midterm to reduce the use of fossil fuel and biomass combustions while favoring to the transition to renewable energy resources sources. SARS-CoV-2 can also rapidly diffuse in any indoor environment, but technology and different technologies can be used to reduce the risk of virus diffusions to near zero. It is pivotal to increase the interpersonal safety distance between two matters and make use of the FFP2 face mask compulsory both indoors and, and outdoors. New data from the World Health Organization showed that nine out of 10 individuals breathe air containing high levels of pollutants, which increase the risk of heart attacks, pneumonia, and even death. This underscores how pollution represents a major global and human security threat, as well how it impacts social economic dynamics in our society. OCPA, therefore, should serve as a platform to share promising practices and act as a catalyst for other efforts in the field. As parliamentarians, we should advocate for tighter environment regulations, promote interdisciplinary knowledge sharing, especially between scientists and policymakers, develop innovative policy guidance based on the latest security developments and relevant scientific findings. Addressing global issues such as climate change, pollution and environmental degradation, as well as their detrimental impact on our health and security has become pivotal for many countries. What we need is a more balanced and forward looking development strategy in response to the growing environmental concerns as well as to the security expectations of current and future generations. As parliamentarians, we should redirect efforts towards building a truly sustainable development model in which economic, social, environment, and public health factors are duly balanced. Notably, the transition from fossil fuel to green energy is generally recognized as a single most relevant step towards cleaner air and the mitigation of climate change. In this context, the new EU long-term budget coupled with the next generation EU represent an incredible opportunity to build a greener, more digital and resilient Europe. We should also strive to leave no one behind as we will only be as strong as the weakest link in the chain. The environment is only one and all humans and nations will need it to survive and prosper. Against this background, Participating states should consider support projects that prioritize investment in green technology, clean transport, and low carbon energy transition. Support green finance and economics that consider the environment impact and enhance environmental sustainability. Are harnessing the opportunities offered by the digital revolutions and by emerging technologies to support the green transition and ensure equality, inclusiveness, and safety. Dear participants, while the international community has failed to prevent the COVID-19 pandemic, it should learn to handle future similar crises and protect the planet and the people living on it. National and international parliamentary bodies should play a critical role in making sure this is the case. We are facing a landmark moment in modern history and we should be up to the job. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. Dear um, Elona, thank you very much for your engagement. 
and also for your comprehensive presentation, which I believe nailed the, down the most pressing items in our line of work. I fully agree with you. This has been and still is a landmark year for many issues on our agenda. We should not lose momentum and seize uh, this opportunity to promote real, lasting, uh, real and lasting changes for the benefit of all. Dear Marco, I will now give back to you the floor um, for fa facilitating the debate among the interested participants, because I guess you have the list. Please, Marco, uh, you will work on the list now. And I'm glad, I'm looking forward to hear all the participants. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, dear, Ori, dear Doris, uh, uh, Arthur, and Alona for your leadership. Uh, and of course, for sharing such inspir inspirational insights with all of us. I'm now opening uh, the debate under this agenda items. For your information, the list of speakers is also uh, pasted on the chat. Uh, we have, as of now, 16, and the list is closed, 16 committee members who have registered under this agenda item and about 35 minutes for uh, the debate. So we the, we will allot two minutes per intervention uh, as agreed with the uh, committee chair. Um, the countdown timer will be visible on your screen and it will indicate the remaining time for your intervention. Please, once it becomes red, kindly conclude your, your remarks. Um, I now call on the first speaker on the list, which is uh, the special representative on Arctic issue from Norway, Ms. Toril Eichheim. Toril, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Excellencies, colleagues and friends. I uh, first of all want to uh, thank Elona uh, for her uh, thorough report. The points she made are indeed policy priorities for all of us. I endorse them fully. In this regard, I uh, would like to urge the OSCE EPA and the OSCE as a whole to step up our contribution to promote environmental security. The role of international organizations is to bring states together to find common responses and invest in cooperation. The OSCE as a security organization must address decisively security threats stemming from climate change and also environmental degradation. My call on this also comes as a clear conclusion from the work I've carried out since the beginning of my mandate as a special representative on Arctic issues. As you know, my priority has been looking into the effects of climate change on Arctic societies. We still need to raise awareness on how what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. In fact, it's just that consequences are more rapidly visible at higher latitudes. But actually, this is affecting us all. The Arctic is ringing an alarm to all of us. So, dear colleagues, I hope you will find it interesting and look into the final report with the key conclusions which you would find on the EPA website and also in the, the e-folder of this winter meeting. We need to take on board our responsibility, also providing future hope through our political activities. Sustainable development is the key word here. Our youth in particular is pleading us to make use of our power to protect the planet and also future generations. So to conclude and taking into, the, uh, into account uh, what we've heard so far that today, we should really explore ways to develop a more structured portfolio on the work on climate within the assembly. It's clear that there is an value, an added value that we can play as MPs. We just need to make use of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker on my list is uh, Ms. Irene Karalambides, a special representative on fighting corruption, and she will be followed by Ms. Mr. Brian Fitzpatrick from the United States. 
Thank you, Marco. Dear colleagues, I highly appreciate the opportunity to shortly address uh, today's uh, session of our second committee. To begin with, I wish to commend uh, your genuine efforts in the economic and the environmental dimension, including in the field of fighting corruption. Your report, the Arilona, is quite impressive and I fully second many of the things uh, you eloquently stressed. For instance, that fighting corruption is to remain a top priority across the OSE region, including a time of crisis. The role of the special representative on fighting corruption is precisely to build political momentum to our anti-corruption work. As a matter of fact, political will is the alpha and the omega of any effective anti-corruption strategy. Without political will, anti-corruption laws remain empty shells. Accordingly, I plan to keep political pressure high through a new resolution at our next annual session. Such a document would build on the findings of a major OSCPA event held in the late 2020 on the strategic partnership between politicians and journalists in this context. But preventing and combating corruption also required coordinated responses at both national and international levels. This is where I see the greatest potential of cooperation with our General Committee on Economic Affairs, Science, Technology and Environment, as well with the OSC executive structures with whom I enjoy an excellent cooperation. In this review, I warmly welcome the recently adopted Ministerial Council decision, preventing and combating corruption through digitalization, uh, which recognizes the vital contribution of parliamentarians in fighting corruption. Against this background, I wish to encourage all members of this important committee to continue to lead by example in this field, which greatly undermines our collective security. Thank you very much for your attention. My best regards to all of you. Thank you. Back to you, Marco. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Karalambides, also for being very uh, punctual in your remarks. Uh, the next speaker on my list is Mr. Brian Fitzpatrick from the United States, who will be followed by Mr. Uh, Kira Zoglu from Turkey. Thank you, Marco. Pleasure to be with everyone this morning, uh, this morning, U.S. time anyway. Um, and I think that the massive global stimulus effort uh, currently on our way to get the world economy back on track after COVID-19, I think we all need to be cognizant, uh, could be a prime opportunity for unscrupulous officials to engage in corruption. Uh, and in this environment, the fight against corruption is more important than ever. And it should come as no surprise to anyone in this room uh, that legislatures have one of the most important roles to play in combating corruption, uh, that of establishing a transparent and accountable legal and financial framework that empowers law enforcement officials and is maximally uh, resistant to fraud. Uh, before my election to Congress, I served as a uh, FBI special agent uh, across the, uh, the globe, really, where I worked uh, international corruption matters. Uh, I worked with my team to bring kleptocrats to justice uh, and help other countries develop their anti-corruption and law enforcement agencies. Uh, unfortunately, the globalization of corruption makes this job difficult. Transnational um, uh, corrupt officials across multiple countries evading law enforcement and exploiting their legal regimes that most benefit their own uh, criminal activities. All 57 participating states have found themselves part of this system of globalized corruption. Where the rule of law is weaker, money is stolen, and where the rule of law is stronger, money is hidden. Uh, states in the middle often help launder stolen money. And we encourage all participating states to openly acknowledge their problems and work in tandem with all of us to solve them. And I urge participating states to join forces uh, in order to fight corruption. These crimes cannot be solved on strictly a national level. And law enforcement agencies need to cooperate in order to succeed in curbing transnational crimes such as money laundering. Financial crimes produce political instability and are used to fund terrorism, human trafficking, and other transnational organized crime, and they undermine democratic institutions and good governance worldwide. So I emphasize the need uh, for beneficial ownership, transparency across the OSCE. Anonymous shell companies are the means through which much modern money laundering occurs. Uh, in Congress, we have passed strong beneficial ownership transparency legislation that will ban uh, US anonymous shell companies. And I've also introduced legislation that will allow certain penalties from the enforcement of criminal anti-corruption laws to be recycled into global anti-corruption work. Civil society and the free press play a crucial role 
as corruption watchdogs and a strong civil society holds public officials accountable for safeguards. Uh, with that, Marco, I appreciate your time and I yield back. Thank you very much. And the next speaker is Mr. Kirezoglu from Turkey, followed by Mr. Mirkishili from Azerbaijan. Oksa for her comprehensive presentation. In this particular period, this topic is one of the crucial issues that should be discussed in detail. The pandemic is much more than a health crisis. If not tech, it has the potential to inflict damaging social, economic, humanitarian, and political effects. In the face of the unprecedented global crisis, OSCPA has been dedicated to find a way to enhance and build a dialogue on the international level among its members. As previous President Seretelli wrote into the introduction of the report, OSCPA versus COVID-19 phase, faced with the need to provide a global response to this global crisis, the OSCPA has encouraged close coordination with parliaments at the national and international levels to promote democratic democratic, effective, and coherent public policy responses, and to address our citizens' concerns with its parliamentary web dialogues on several issues, including economy and environment. This was, of course, with the price-worthy efforts of the ex-president, secretary general, and the international secretariat, which has given an opportunity to improve dialogue, trust, and information exchange among countries at a time of crisis. To prevent the spread of COVID-19, governments around the world have introduced a range of drastic measures. Some of these measures have severe economic consequences. Social distancing and travel restrictions have led to a reduced workforce across all economic sectors and caused the loss of countless jobs, not least in travel, tourism and leisure sectors. We have to find the right balance between protecting public health and maintaining social and economic life, life while containing the spread of the virus. The pandemic has affected the environment as well. Reduced greenhouse emissions has been a windfall of measures taken to confront the pandemic as these measures almost stopped the travel and transport. On the other hand, the pandemic has increased the production and the use of plastic materials in daily life, which threats nature and climate. We are confident that Rapporteur hopes to reflect the consequences of the ongoing pandemic in a comprehensive, inclusive, and result-oriented manner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, the next list, uh, speaker on my list is Mr. Mirkishili from Azerbaijan, followed by Vice President uh, Alizar from France. Thanks. Thank you very much, dear Ms. Barnett and dear colleagues. As you know, road and rail transport between Azerbaijan and Armenia, which connected the South Caucasus to Europe via Turkey, was closed in 1993 after the occupation of the part of Azerbaijan by Armenia. Due to occupation, the region's infrastructure became actually disconnected. But last year, the fact of occupation was eliminated. Azerbaijan liberated its own territories. Armenia has withdrawn its troops and four UN resolution has been executed. COVID-19 pandemic situation declined economic growth in all countries. To fight with the results of the pandemic, we have to combine our efforts to cooperate with each other. For this reason, Azerbaijan and Turkey offer three plus three regional cooperation format. This format includes Turkey, Russia, Iran, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Armenia. Our region has an excellent economic connectivity with the West and East, and we believe that such format of cooperation will build confidence between the countries of the regions. Six country regional cooperation platform would be a win-win initiative for all regional actors in the Caucasus. If the current debt block can be broken, the continued implementation of the projects such as Traseka and Belt and Road Initiative could turn the region into an inclusive economic corridor with great benefits for all six countries, which could be then form a bridge between Europe and Asia. 
All countries of regions need to act together. On the trade relations and public diplomacy can help the demilitarize of the South Caucasus region. Using this opportunity, I want to call my colleagues to support these initiatives in their own government, because only the supporting them to work together will achieve us to fight with pandemic, with pandemic results in the good relation in future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is Monsieur Pascal Aliza from France, who will be followed by Mr. Dengin from Russia. Monsieur le Vice President, à vous la parole. In case the Mr. Vice President is not uh, available right now, we'll move to the next speaker on the list, Mr. Vadim Dengin from Russia, followed by Mr. Aboyan from Armenia. Добрый Добрый день, уважаемые друзья. Спасибо огромное за предоставленное слово. Ну, 2020 год стал поворотным в вопросе развития интернета. Люди в условиях пандемии лишены свободно передвигаться, общаться в привычном формате офлайн. И, вы, и, соответственно, повседневное общение с близкими друзьями, поход в кино, покупки, проведение рабочих встреч и мероприятий, вот примером, который является наша с вами встреча, все теперь это в онлайн-режиме. В этом есть, конечно, свои плюсы и минусы, но мы хотим поговорить сейчас о резком увеличении роли интернета как общественного пространства. И это резкое увеличение роли интернета привело к тому, что крупные интернет-площадки почувствовали за собой не только силу, но и получили возможность влиять на все сферы жизнедеятельности нашей. В руках интернет-гигантов оказались рычаги воздействия как на экономические, социальные, культурные сферы, ну и главная сфера, естественно, политическая. Влияние достигло такого уровня, что социальные сети по собственному усмотрению руководствуются непонятно какими принципами, стали блокировать и затыкать рот через некоторые э, свои возможности и, и, и дели, делиться этой своей, тормозить эти все э, блокировки и закрывать рот журналистам, общественным деятелям, политическим деятелям, среди которых есть и мои, естественно, соотечественники. Это неприемлемо. Не понравилось точки зрения, заблокировали. Даже не понимая, что они сами же расписываются в собственной жесткой цензуре. Конечно, в России достаточно СМИ которые и интернет-ресурсов, которые критикуют власть, но эти СМИ никто не блокирует, и они продолжают вещать с каждодневной критикой. Агрегаторы, ведущие бизнес, получающие огромные прибыли, обязаны иметь свои официальные представительства, исполнять местные законодательства, а не скрываться от запросов официальных регуляторов или затягивать ответы на них. Естественно, Социальные сети должны модерировать размещение противоправного контента, обладая достаточным количеством необходимого персонала и активно взаимодействовать с официальными ведомствами. Но нашего, считаю, что наша с вами площадка дает возможность услышать любую точку зрения в рамках конструктивного диалога и попытаться урегулировать возникающие проблемы в нашем обществе. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you very much. Uh, the next uh, speaker on the list is Mr. Aboyan from uh, Armenia, followed by Mr. Pittikopitis from Cyprus. In case Mr. Aboyan is not available, we will move to Mr. Pittikopitis from Cyprus. You are the floor. Thank you very much. We don't hear you. We need, you should unmute. You. Yes. Mr. President, dear colleagues, good afternoon from Cyprus. Undoubtedly, we are confronted with a crisis like no other. The COVID-19 pandemic is causing tragic loss of life, severe human suffering and major disruption to the global economy. Cyprus has an open and dynamic economy, which is heavily dependent on services and tourism 
and is exposed to a number of external risks. Since the outbreak of the pandemic, the broad tourism industry, travel and transport, hotels, etc., has been hit the hardest, while target measures have not yielded the desired results. Moreover, prolonged lockdowns, devastating retail and restaurants, have increased private lending and unemployment, and have reduced government revenues. As, a, as, a, as an EU member state, Cyprus have benefited from support measures put in place with the union by the union to provide a social safety net for employees and vulnerable social groups affected by the pandemic. It is worth no noting that Cyprus has been conducting the greatest number of rapid tests in Europe and has successfully developed a threefold strategy, namely testing, detection, and vaccination to contain the spread of the virus. The action we take now will determine the spread and strength of our recovery as a sustainable, innovative one. Therefore, special attention must be paid to green recovery and the adoption of best practices in the land management, wildfire management, flood risk prevention, renewable energy, and biodiversity protection. The European Green Deal, through which the EU aims to become climate neutral by 2050, constitutes a key tool in recovery efforts for COVID-19. Cyprus is planning various actions and projects for the next three years which relate to its transition to green recovery and development, particularly in the context in a national resilience and recovery plan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker on our, my list is Mr. Gerasimov from Ukraine, followed by Mr. Obradovich from Serbia. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Madam Chairperson, distinguished colleagues, uh, on behalf of Ukrainian delegation in the OECPA, um, I would like to reiterate full support to the OEC concept of comprehensive security that cannot be holistic without addressing properly environmental and economic aspects of security. And in the context of the ongoing Russian armed aggression against Ukraine, we would like to draw your attention one more time to the deterioration of the ecological situation in the temporarily occupied territories of Ukraine. The Russian occupying authorities continue to inflict irreversible damage to the affected regions and ecosystems, in particular by degrading treatment of natural resources, flooding of mines, demolishment of infrastructural facilities, and exposing the population of Crimea and Donbass to the health risks. The real picture of this disaster is also compounded as the international experts are banned by the Russian occupation administrations from entering the occupied territories. However, it doesn't change the fact that the consequences will affect not only Ukraine, but the entire region. Persistent damage to the environmental by toxic emissions of titan plant in the illegally occupied Crimea presents a serious challenge while the illegal construction of so-called Crimean bridge has already affected dramatically the ecosystem of the Cap Strait and surrounding waters. With indignation and concern, we draw your attention to the issue of radioactive security in the Russia-occupied parts of Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Major point we would like to attract your attention to is the flooding by occupational administrations of a former coal mine unit communal known as Object Klivash. This issue requires urgent consideration and is raised by Ukraine in the framework of the trilateral contact group, but seem to be blocked by Russia. Further delay in addressing this issue is bound to cause disastrous ecological and nuclear repercussions of transboundary nature. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Gerasimov, the next speaker is Mr. Obradovic from Serbia, followed by Ms. McFedran, McFedran from Canada. Thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues. Um, although the fight, fight against the COVID-19 is still 
ongoing. And I, I may say that Serbia has managed to preserve people's lives and health to a great extent to prevent a decline of, uh, in production and ensure country's economic growth. Besides the medical treatment, Serbia continued the fight against the new virus by vaccination of the population. So far, Serbia has managed to acquire more than 2 million doses of four various vaccines. According to the number of vaccinated citizens with regard to the total population, Serbia has the second fastest vaccine rollout in Europe and six in the world. And according to the number of revaccinated citizens, we now rank first in Europe. We also uh, show our wish to, to help other countries in the region in their fight against Corona. Uh, Serbia has donated several thousand vaccines to the North Macedonia and Montenegro. Direct financial assistance and numerous other facilities, notably in the field of tax policy, have also, uh, also been provided by the Serbian governments to numerous enterprises. These measures help mitigate negative impact of COVID-19 on the economy, sustain production, and help most of the people keen their jobs. The influx of foreign investment was uh, uh, 2.9 billion euro last year. Thanks to all these elements, Serbia's GDP dropped less than minus 1%. Data indicate that Serbia is going to have highest GDP growth in the period by 2022, and that the economic growth in 2000, uh, to, uh, 2021 will be 6%. Uh, 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 Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Obradovic. The next speaker on my list is Ms. McFedron from Canada, followed by Ms. Grigorian from Armenia. Thank you uh, very much, Madam Chairperson. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Um, honorable colleagues, we know COVID-19 pandemic has worsened the economic marginalization of many groups within our society. My remarks focus on strategic advantages of investing in building back better through she recovery, not just recovery. UN Women tells us the global recession will result in a prolonged dip in women's incomes and labor force participation with compounded impacts for women already living in poverty. The International Labor Organization reports that the pandemic has had a severely negative impact on young people's access to employment and education. As parliamentarians, we can make the economic empowerment of women and youth priorities in comprehensive security and economic recovery plans. To be effective, any economic recovery plan cannot be one size fits all. Fair recovery requires intersectional analysis guided by the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and Gender Equality. Reproductive health rights are essential to economic recovery. Consider the strategy of the US state of Hawaii's feminist economic recovery plan. They say, rather than rush to rebuild the status quo of inequality, we should encourage a deep structural transition to an economy that better values the work we know is essential to sustaining us. Canada has gender parity in both the Cabinet of Government and the Senate, and last week, our Minister for Women and Gender Equality, the Honourable Marianne Monsef, announced an unprecedented 100 million in emergency funding for grassroots or women's organizations providing vital services to counter gender-based violence. To ensure that progress on gender equality is not rolled back as a result of the pandemic, this is an investment in accelerating systemic change for women across economic, social, and political spheres. Parliamentarians, we need to do this, and I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker on my list is Ms. Uh, Grigorian from Armenia, followed by Mr. Pirti Lahati from Finland. Um, thank you, Marco. And can I be heard by everyone? 
So good day, dear delegates. Um, I wanna thank the organizers for putting together this winter meeting, despite the continuing coronavirus situation, and also the speakers who spoke uh, both today, but also during the previous days, two days. Due to the short time, I have to concentrate only on two items today, and I need to speak about the regional perspective. And uh, saying this, I have to say that um, talking about economic and environmental issues, it is impossible to disregard the very basic condition without which it is senseless to talk about economy. It's the peace. As we all know, last September, against all calls for peace, during pandemic by the international community, Azerbaijan unleashed a war against Nagorno-Karabakh and its people, resulting in thousands of casualties, both about military personnel and civilian population. After the ceasefire announcement on November 9, 2020, the points of the agreement are not being implemented by Azerbaijan. And today, my colleague from Azerbaijani delegation speaking about unblocking the roads and communications in the region speaks about its, uh, the benefits of unblocking. And Armenia has signed the announcement on January 11, and one of the paragraphs is exactly the unblocking. And Armenia welcomes this, uh, the, this paragraph. However, we cannot speak about trust and confidence when we have the prisoners of war who today are being fakely, fakely and groundlessly called terrorists. Again, today Baku is trying to portray them as terrorists and showing that Azerbaijan is using this, them as hostage, the hostages as means for bargaining with Armenia and politicizing this purely humanitarian issue. As my time is scarce, I wanna say that it is our obligation to stand strong in protecting human rights and the values which we all claim to be ours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker on my list is Mr. Pirtilati from Finland, followed by Mr. Ganjaliev from Azerbaijan. Thank you, Marco. Madam Chair, the colleagues, I would like to uh, thank you, our rapporteur, Mr. Hoxha, for her interrupted remarks. During this pandemic, it has become evident how important, important it is to protect people's well-being during this crisis. We must now find a road for exiting the pandemic in a way that is ecological, social, and also economical sustainable. Focusing our efforts in the green growth is key. We must bear in mind that climate change is even bigger threat to the humanity than this pandemic. My country, Finland, is committed to the reducing climate emissions and supporting growth into the economy by the reforming energy taxation and supporting to the electrification in our industry. We want to return to the uh, sustainable growth track throughout education, research and innovation. We all know that the Arctic areas has been severely impacted by the climate change. In addition, the resilience of the Arctic communities has seriously been threatened by this pandemic. Finland has a very ambitious and cross-cutting strategy for the Arctic, the region, the environment, economy, citizens and civil society. But our efforts alone are not enough. The future of the Arctic depends on our global efforts to combat climate change. We need multilateral and cross-border cooperation. We need to strengthen and support Arctic policies in various fora and organizations, including uh, OC. I would like to comment uh, our special representative on Arctic issues, Ms. Turtil Einstein, for her work, work to put the Arctic on the agenda of our assembly. Finally, dear colleagues, I would like to say that I'm convinced that we now take, uh, now take seriously these unique opportunities for a green transition. It will be turn it lead a happier, healthier and more prosperous societies, which will turn create a more peaceful and state, stateable world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, sir. The next speaker on my list is Mr. Ganjiliev from uh, Azerbaijan, followed by Mr. Paras from Belarus. Mr. Ganjiliev, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson, dear colleagues. Uh, just I would like to say that it's impossible to imagine 
the, to ensure the full security in the OSC region uh, without ensuring also the economic and uh, environmental security, especially in this very important uh, region of the South Caucasus, which uh, comprises uh, integral part of the OSC area. And of course, it is uh, some, somehow upsetting and dismaying to see some of my Armenian colleagues still talking in past terms, because um, just I would like to say that we have to focus more on the regional cooperation, economic development and environmental security issues, rather than raising up again the old issues uh, which have been already resettled. The conflict is over and I would like to invite my Armenian colleagues to, sp uh, to speak uh, about the regional cooperation as my colleague Mr. Tahir Mirchili mentioned. Azerbaijan is now playing a very important role in connecting and building up regional platform for all countries in the region. And when it comes to the uh, Armen prisoners of war, of course all Armenian prisoners, prisoners of war have been returned to Armenia. But when it comes after this trilateral statement signed between Azerbaijan, Armenia and Russia, there were some uh, sabotage groups uh, which tried to invade uh, and to commit some uh, terrorist acts in the territory of Azerbaijan. And of course, these subversive acts were prevented and uh, those people who tried to invade uh, were detained. And uh, uh, it's very important to, uh, to defer these issues. The prisoners of war is one issue and the sub subversive acts are is different one. So um, it is very important that we take it into consideration and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, the next and last speaker on my list is Mr. Karas from Belarus. Mr. Karas, the floor is yours. Доброго здоровья, уважаемые коллеги. Позвольте поблагодарить за возможность принять участие и пожелать продуктивной работы. Но сейчас, когда весь мир столкнулся с пандемией и сотни тысяч людей серьезно страдают из-за этого, нам необходимо развивать сотрудничество. В частности, Беларусь следовала всем рекомендациям ВОЗ и не водила а, на своей территории жесткого локдауна. Мы не закрывали предприятия, не останавливали промышленность, а, учреждения не закрывали. Мы определялись а, социальным дистанцированием, а, где, возможно, перевели работников на дистанционно, а, школы, университеты. А, значит, мы избежали а, тем самым резкого экономического падения в стране избежали социального недовольствия граждан, в том числе сохранили рабочие места, сохранили источники доходов для нашего населения и в результате не допустили резкого падения экономики, в результате чего не допустили резкого падения ВВП страны. Тем самым система здравоохранения разработала методику, благодаря которой удалось избежать перегрузки этой системы. Это выявляли контакты первого уровня, второго уровня, все это позволило избежать и больших, большого количества летальных исходов среди населения, именно ковидных пациентов. Уважаемые коллеги, действительно сейчас, когда мир столкнулся с такой проблемой, нам необходимо проявить солидарность и консолидироваться. Благодаря этому мы сможем преодолеть все кризисы. В заключение белорусская сторона подтверждает свою готовность к, отры... к откры... открытому уважительному диалогу со своими коллегами. Спасибо за внимание. Всем здоровья. Берегите себя. Thank you very much. This concludes the list of speaker under this agenda item. Uh, dear Elona, uh, rapporteur, would you like to reply to some of the points which have been raised in the debate? Uh, if so, the floor is yours. Thank you, dear Marco, and thank you all to the uh, our colleagues and uh, about their speeches and uh, also supporting uh, the report and all the recommendation that we have uh, provided today. Of course, it's clear that um, uh, all of their concerns are, uh, most of the concerns are, uh, are in, the, in the report. And uh, with regards to the, for example, with regards to the to the fighting corruption, with regards to the uh, rule of law, uh, which needs uh, definitely needs to be stronger, with uh, improving dialogue among countries and uh, the the how also the COVID nineteen has also influenced us economic and the way how we also respond as well, and uh, also how. Uh, 
how also the cooperation between countries and the regions need to be stronger and to be booster as well. Uh, also, I found it also interesting mentioning also the the, the role of the of the green um, uh, renewable energy and which also has been mentioned in the in the report and the green recovery and also uh, global security security as well. Uh, um, also, what I found it also interesting is that uh, a good uh, a good uh, uh, collaboration and uh, solidarity among the countries uh, to, uh, to 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 work together and to find uh, also uh, much more specific mechanisms and suitable mechanisms uh, that uh, we need to to deal with in terms of the also the format and the priorities of the of our committee uh, committee on economic affairs uh, uh, science technology and environment so i thank all the uh, the participants and the colleagues as well uh, as uh, as also i said in my speech as well that the national and international parliamentary bodies should uh, play a crucial role, role and to tackle all together all uh, the priorities and the concerns which we need to address as soon as possible. And uh, the last one, uh, knowing uh, and affecting how the, the, the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has affected us, uh, we need also to learn how we can handle a future similar crisis and uh, learn from the best practices. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Rapporteur. And thank you all, of course, for your very enriching uh, and timely interventions. I will now give the floor back to our dear chair for introducing the next agenda item, Doris. Well, thank you, dear Marco. And thank you to all the participants. It was a very good and interesting debate. And um, dear colleagues, please allow me now to move to the next agenda. Um, traditionally, the OSCEPA winter meeting provides a rather unique opportunity for direct interaction with the OSCE ex uh, executive structures on the latest developments related to our common areas of work. Albeit through an online format, today's meeting will allow us to do so as we wanted. Under the impulse of my predecessor, Mrs. Nilsa de Sena, our committee has reached out more uh, con consistently to the OSCE executive structures over the last few years. We have regularly contributed to relevant OSCE in in initiatives and events in the second uh, dimension. Our goal was to, re and remains, to better align our representative uh, respective agendas and complement our work plans, bringing increased visibility and continuity to our common efforts. Your, uh, your, your presence today is yet another opportunity to do so. Against this backdrop, we greatly appreciate that our increased engagement is duly reflected in the 2020 Ministerial Council discuss, uh, decision on preventing and combating corruption through di digitalization and increased transparency. I'm assured I can assure you that we will continue to promote dialogue amongst the OSCE parliamentarians to strengthen legislation essential in preventing and combating corruption. Following the and the established practice, we will now hear the plan of the OSCE Economic and Environmental Committee, Ambassador Florian Raunig, He's the permanent representative of um, Austria to the OSCE. We heard him already yesterday. Uh, and the newly appoint and the, is the newly appointed chair of the OSCE Economic and Environmental Committee. Prior to this post, Ambassador Raunig served as the head of the OSCE, the presence in Albania, and the head of the task force for the Austrian chairmanship in 2017. Dear Ambassador, thank you for your readiness to share your experience with us, as well as for your efforts in bringing forward the economic and environmental dimension of the OECE. I'm con confident that we share, uh, shall develop a fruitful and uh, result-oriented partnership. Your Excellency, now the floor is yours. 
Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Chairperson, Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great privilege for me to present you an outlook of the work of the Economic and Environmental Committee for the year 2021. I would like to thank the Swedish chairpersonship for entrusting me to chair the Economic and Environmental Committee and further continue and proceed with our systematic and impactful work. I also would like to present my sincere thanks to the Albanian chairmanship for their devoted work during the last year and for the meaningful outcomes in the economic and environmental dimension. In 2020, despite the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have successfully continued our work aimed at strengthening the second dimension. Our efforts also led to the adoption of an important ministerial council that just has been mentioned by you, Madam Chair, the decision on preventing and combating corruption through digitalization and increased transparency. Hence, we can look back to a very fruitful year. Madam Chair, please allow me to shortly present the overall frame of the second dimension in 2021 and the distribution of sectors and topics amongst the three main fora of the dimension. First, the Economic and Environmental Forum will be devoted to the chairpersonship's priority of economic empowerment and increased economic participation of women. The first and second preparatory meeting of the Economic and Environmental Forum will provide a platform for discussion on how OEC participating states can promote women's equal economic participation and opportunities. At the concluding meeting in Prague in September, we will consider the recommendations, best practices and substantive ideas generated during the forum's process. As for the choice of the themes addressed in the Economic and Environmental Committee meetings, let me highlight that the Swedish chairpersonship and the EEC chair, which means myself, agreed to concentrate on environmental topics that we consider as imminent and pressing. The 2021 work program has been closely consulted with the participating states and will have a close look into and analyze security issues in connection with climate, biodiversity, sustainable economic development, sustainable economic recovery after the COVID-19 pandemic, good environmental governance, and hazardous waste management. This will deepen our understanding regarding possible ways of coping with the multiple challenges lying ahead of us. Additionally, practical examples of result-orientated programs and projects will be provided by the OSC field operations. The committee's thematic agenda has been chosen with the aim to address issues of common concern that could then be translated into a political commitment. In this regard, the majority of thematic meetings will focus on the environmental issues I just mentioned before, around which we believe a possible ministerial council deliverable could be built. Third, finally, the economic and environmental implementation meeting will devote its attention to the topic of corruption. Corruption represents an imminent and pressing threat to security. Thanks to last year's deliverable at the Tirana Ministerial Council, we were able to advance a big step together in our common commitment and efforts to combat this dangerous phenomenon. I'm confident that with this thematic distribution, the forum concentrating on economic issues, the implementation meeting on corruption and the committee on environment, a sound balance between the economic and environmental aspects of our dimension has been found. Environment and economy are closely interlinked and even more in our present time. We can only successfully cope with the disastrous effects of both the COVID pandemic and the destruction of environment by closely connecting midterm economic recovery measures 
with the long-term perspective of protecting the environment, including the climate. Additionally, corruption continues to be a serious threat to our common efforts, not, last, not least by multiplying already existing negative impacts. Hence, I'm convinced that the Swedish chairpersonship chose a well thought, timely and up-to-date approach by closely combining the three main pillars of the second dimension. In addition, I would like to stress that the OEC's economic and environmental activities have the potential to foster dialogue, building confidence and trust, diminishing tensions, and promoting good neighborly relationships. In this regard, I'm confident that enhancing our understanding and cooperation on economic and environmental issues will help to strengthen security, peace, and prosperity in the OEC region. This is of utmost importance, in particular during and in the aftermath of the current pandemic, a phenomenon so far unknown for us. Madam Chairperson, we repeatedly evoke the second dimension's potential, as I just did right now. However, we also agree that this potential is not used to the extent it could be. It is, 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 it is exactly here where I see an increasingly important and challenging line of action for the Parliamentary Assembly of the OSCE. Parliamentarians, having got the mandate from their people, are the appropriate body to overcome lack of knowledge and mistrust in order to prepare the ground for mutual understanding. By surmounting existing mental, emotional and political barriers, the Parliamentary Assembly has the potential to anchor transboundary economic and environmental cooperation. Hence, let me invite all of you to mobilize our forces sense of cooperation, ability to compromise, and overall political will in order to awaken this potential. Let me reassure you that my team and I personally will make every effort with the view to achieving practical results in a cooperative and productive spirit. We are committed to closely cooperate with the Parliamentary Assembly, the Swedish 2021 chairpersonship, and the Office of the Coordinator on Economic and Environmental Affairs of the OEC in order to confront the manifold challenges lying ahead. Madam Chair, distinguished parliamentarians, I thank you for your attention. Dear Mr. Ambassador Raunig, thank you for your clear words. Actually, we are on the same line. And what makes us so uh, sad is that we, everybody, the ministerial side, the parliamentarian side, we all know what needs to be done, but where is the key that we can make things happen? This is the big question mark. Anyway, thank you. I'm particularly glad to hear that um, our uh, priorities resonate and that you plan to further enhance our cooperation. Ambassador Vuk Zugic, in his capacity of coordinator of the OSCE economic and environmental activities, will now present the work of his office. The, o o S um, the OCE -E -A is mandated to support the OSCE participating states in implementing commitments in the economic and environmental security dimensions. Prior to his post, Ambassador Zukic was the permanent representative of the Republic of Serbia to the OECE and served as the chairperson of the OECE Permanent Council during Serbia's OECE chairmanship in 2015. Dear Ambassador, uh, dear, uh, the Assembly reiterates its full support to your office. I'm quite eager to learn more about your plans and jo jointly explore ways to bring our interaction to a new level. Please, Mr. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Barrett, uh, distinguished members of the OSCPA, ladies and gentlemen. 
Thank you for the opportunity offered to address the General Committee on Economic Affairs, Science, Technology and Environment. At the outset, I would like to welcome the growing and fruitful interaction between my office and the OSCPA, including in the framework of uh, Economic and Environmental Forum, EDIM, and the regular meetings of the committee. Madam Chairperson, the restrictions put in place throughout the whole OSC region since the beginning of the pandemic have inevitably imposed a, resh a reshaping of the modus operandi of my office and of our activities. As we did in 2020, and when possible also this year, all planned activities in all areas of our mandate will continue to be implemented in online or in blended formats, and will continue to increase our focus on the impact of digitalization on security, stability, and sustainable growth and development. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we started to exploit even more new formats of capacity building activities. In this regard, we launched the OSC e-learning e platform, which hosts a number of online models on good governance and on the protection of critical energy networks. This year, we plan to continue developing the platform by expanding the thematic coverage and increasing the number of available models. The office will also continue to organize different events and webinars focused on addressing and discussing economic and environmental challenges which impact on security, including how the OSCE would, could support its participating states in coping with and recovering from the COVID-19 crisis. I would welcome the opportunity for a joint OCA, OCA PA initiative in this regard. We are committed to achieve the objectives and outcomes as spelled out in the 2021 United Bu Unified Budget Proposal. To do so, and in line with our mandate based on the relevant MC decisions, the office will make the most effective use of the limited resources allocated in the unified budget, while maximizing its efforts to secure additional financial support through extra budgetary projects and initiatives. Greater efforts will be devoted to design and implement activities that not only meet the needs of beneficiary countries, but most importantly, have clear tangible and measurable results and impact. Your role as parliamentarians to promote in your respective countries and with your governments the activities we implement is crucial and we appreciate your active engagement in this regard. We will further intensify our consultations and collaboration with participating states and their relevant institutions with the aim to increase the relevance and ownership of our initiatives. Our constant engagement in improving the quality of our interventions and the progressive increase in the requests for assistance from the participating states is an indicator of the effectiveness of the action displayed by the office in assisting participating states in the implementation of their commitments. We will continue to implement our mandate through targeted measures, including advisory and technical support and capacity building actions in order to strengthen regional and transboundary cooperation national capacity and multi-stakeholder dialogue. A gender approach will continue to be mainstream in our activities. Moreover, and where possible, a youth perspective will be also incorporated into these activities. Ladies and gentlemen, the second dimension commitments place cooperation, prevention, and economic and environmental good governance on the cornerstone of our engagement. This is essential to enhance security and stability thus preventing possible conflicts in our region. In order to ensure effectiveness of the prevention efforts, the office will continue to provide targeted support to promote good governance and positive business climate with a focus on preventing and combating corruption, money laundering, asset recovery, including through digital tools and new technologies. And this is one of the main goals of the last year's decision in the Ministerial Council in Tirana. OCA will also continue to promote sustainable and inclusive economic growth and development through its active engagement in promoting connectivity by facilitating trade and transport, effective governance of migration and promotion of human capital development. In the line with the 2021 OSC chairpersonship priorities given by Sweden, particular emphasis will also be given to activities focused on the economic empowerment of women. We will also continue to develop and implement initiatives that address environmental threats to security in cooperation with different UN agencies and regional partners. This includes strengthening transboundary water cooperation and good water governance, 
providing targeted support to promote sound management of hazardous waste, and raising awareness on assessing and addressing potential security risks stemming from climate changes. The OCA will promote good environmental governance, including through ARCO centers, and will continue engaging in disaster risk reduction, including lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. We also plan to continue to promote a strategic dialogue on energy security and strengthening cooperation in that regard, in particular on the protection of energy networks, the promotion of renewable and sustainable energy and energy efficiency. In general, our activities will continue to support participating states in the implementation of 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. In doing so, also to strengthen cross-dimensionality, we aim to cooperate closely with all executive structures, other secretariat departments, OSC Parliamentary Assembly, OSC Partners for Cooperation, and our international organizations to develop and implement activities that promote and contribute to stability and security, regional cooperation, and enhance sustainability and long-term impact. Before concluding, I'm very pleased to inform you that last week, in close cooperation with the Swedish chairpersonship, we organized the first preparatory meeting of the 29th Economic and Environmental Forum, focused on promoting comprehensive security, stability, and sustainable development in the OSC area through women's economic empowerment. I very much appreciate the contribution of Ms. Fry, OSCPA Special Representative of Gender Issues, for having shared her valuable experience. Our discussions have provided considerable food for thought on how we can leverage women's potential towards post-pandemic recovery that leaves no one behind. They confirm that gender equality is critical to the achievement of macroeconomic stability and should be assigned a high priority on the policymakers' agenda, including of policy of parliamentarians. Policy designed to ensure a level, play, uh, a level playing field for women, such as improving women's social and economic rights, and in particular women's health, access to education, financial services, and technology are not only a matter of equity and social justice. They are powerful levers to boost economic growth, benefiting the economy as a whole. Indeed, the OSC commitments were shaped around this evidence. Nevertheless, the impact of the current crisis with the pandemics is calling for action to turn these commitments into actual policy relevant actions. The OSC is well placed to discuss and address those challenges and I look forward to the continuation of our discussion at the second preparatory meeting of the forum cycle which is supposed to take place in May in Stockholm. It has been a great pleasure Madam Chair to share with you these important elements of our work program for this year and of course I look forward to any comments and questions you or your colleagues might have. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, dear Ambassador. As always, your presentation is focused and to the point. And at this point, I need to say goodbye to you. It was a pleasure to be with you, but now I have to go to catch my train because I have a more than five hour trip ahead of me to, to go back for the weekend to my uh, constituency. Thank you and um, thank you all for your good work and good contributions. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, thank you very much, uh, Doris. And, and now uh, we have a debate on agenda item four. And I will again give back the floor to Marco for facilitating the debate among interested participants. Marco, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, and thank you, Doris, of course. Uh, have a safe trip back home. Uh, just before we, we begin with the debate, a technical announcement. Please be informed that at 15.30 sharp, the interpreters will have to stop their service in order to prepare for the next section, which will start at 4 o'clock. We have 10 committee members uh, who have registered to speak under this agenda item. We only have 20 minutes available, so speaking time will be limited to 1 minute and 30 seconds. Uh, I call, therefore, on the first speaker, uh, Mr. Whitehouse from the United States, who will be followed by Mr. Glanzmann Kunkler from Switzerland. Mr. Whitehouse, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Artur. I am um, delighted to be able to join my distinguished colleagues and report American progress on climate and uh, corruption issues. On climate change, thanks to the recent election, the United States is back. 
Secretary Kerry is also back and is determined to make the Glasgow COP a greater victory than even the Paris COP. And we hope that we can, uh, by rejoining nations who share that goal, uh, make it a fact. Um, on the question of corruption, we have just passed significant legislation to reduce shell corporations. As we all know, rule of law nations have indulged corruption, kleptocracy, and autocracy by supporting a global dark economy, sheltering the assets of thieves uh, behind the rule of law. And I hope that we can continue to work together to extinguish that dark money economy. It is a sore on the body politic of rule of law nations. Uh, last, I'll just say that it's a domestic matter, but the fossil fuel industry continues to wreak its mischief through dark money in our politics to slow down American progress, but I'm confident we can overcome it. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Whitehouse. I uh, will now pass the floor to Ms. glunzmann Hunkeler from Switzerland, followed by Mr. Dishumbayev from Kazakhstan. Ja, Herr Vorsitzende, geschätzte Damen und Herren, ich möchte darauf hinweisen, dass Sorry. Wir möchten darauf hinweisen, dass die Pandemie eine Gesundheits- und Sozialkrise ist, eine große Gesundheits- und Sozialkrise und dass viele Menschen schon ihre Jobs verloren haben. Innerhalb der großen wirtschaftlichen Unsicherheit möchten wir auf ein Problem hinweisen, das viele betrifft, viele Migrantinnen und Migranten, die Rücküberweisungen aus der Diaspora an ihre Familien machen. Aufgrund der Covid-19-Pandemie verzeichnen diese Länder einen massiven äh, Einbruch bei diesen Geldzuflüssen aus dem Ausland. Die Schweiz hat zusammen mit Partnern einen Aufruf gestartet, um die Rücküberweisungen während der Krise am Laufen zu halten. Der Zugang der Migrantinnen und Migranten zu Transferdienstleistungen muss verbessert werden, indem zusätzliche digitale Zahlungsmöglichkeiten zur Verfügung gestellt werden. Politische Entscheidungsträger, Regulierungsbehörden und Dienstleistungsanbieter werden weltweit ermuntert, Geldüberweisungen zu erleichtern. Gleichzeitig soll mit einer Informationskampagne auf diese hingewiesen werden, ganz besonders auf die digitalen Transferkanäle. Uns ist es wichtig, dass die OSZD auch den gesundheitlichen Rahmen dabei nicht vergisst und gerade mit einer großflächigen Impfung darauf hinwirkt, dass möglichst bald auch wieder eine Besserung eintreten kann. Und wir bitten die OSZD auch hier, ihren, ihre, ihren Einfluss geltend zu machen. Besten Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Thank you very much. The next speaker on my list is Mr. Докладчиков за их содержательное выступление. Хотел бы акцентировать ваше внимание на вопросах экологической безопасности, важной для всех нас. Казахстан активно предпринимает шаги по переходу к зеленой экономике. Наша страна является участницей рамочной конвенции по изменению климата ООН и Парижского соглашения. В декабре 2020 года на саммите по климатическим амбициям глава государства заявил, что Казахстан обязуется достичь углеродной нейтральности к 2060 году. Принятый экологический кодекс, разработанный с учетом опыта ОСР и стран Евросоюза по экологическому регулированию. Дамы и господа, водные ресурсы в условиях меняющихся климата – это еще один важнейший пункт повестки дня для всех стран мира. В настоящее время мы столкнулись с серьезными вопросами использования водных ресурсов трансграничных рек. Катастрофа Аральского моря оказывает негативное воздействие на условия и качество жизни 70 миллионов человек стран Центральной Азии. Более 5,4 миллиона гектаров превратилось в соляную пустыню источником выноса 150 миллионов тонн солевых аэрозолей в атмосферу Земли, достигающих Европы и даже Антарктиды. При этом казахстанская часть составляет около 2 миллионов гектаров. Безработица, снижение доходов, миграция, низкий уровень продолжительности жизни – это неполный перечень последствий экологического кризиса. 
Государство Центральной Азии совместно с международными организациями прилагает совместные усилия по преодолению экологической и социально-экономической кризиса в бассейне Аральского моря. Действует Международный фонд спасения Арала, созданный странами региона. Полагаем, что ОБСЕ может нести свой вклад в его восстановление и призываем страны, участие организаций, оказать помощь Международному фонду спасения Арала, так как это проблема не только региона, а и всего мирового сообщества. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is Mr. Mirkishvili from Azerbaijan, uh, followed by Mr. Bingo from Turkey. Mirkishvili is not. Mr. Mirkishvili is not available. We will move to the next speaker, Mr. Bingo from uh, Turkey, followed by Ms. Heidi Fry from. <laughs> Distinguished delegates, dear colleagues, we thank both ambassadors for their presentation, stressing inclusive and cooperative approach of the OECE economic environmental dimension for long-term environment gains during this challenging period. In line with its core activities, OECE PA remained committed to multilateralism and acted as a dialogue platform among its members from the very beginning of the COVID-19 crisis. Following the preparatory work by the Secretariat, OECE the Parliamentary Assembly held two parliamentary web dialogue sessions on economy and environment, further giving the member states a floor to discuss best practices, setbacks, and opportunities. These were timely efforts and helped improve the dialogue among countries at the time of crisis. It's important for OECE members to minimize supply chain disruptions by building security corridors. This will not only ensure safety and security of food and essential goods, but also alleviate economic losses stemming from these halts. In addition to that, smooth flow of information among member states, which was largely missing during the early days of the pandemics and proved essential should remain a priority for the post-pandemic recovery. As a part of the global economic agenda, OECE should also address poverty, alleviation, inclusivity, boosting economic productivity and debt sustainability for a resilient and sustainable recovery. Furthermore, giving the persisting inequalities in accessing vaccines and bearing in mind that no one is safe until everyone is safe, member states should initiate a productive dialogue on how best to allocate vaccines. It is also highly important for us to refocus their attention on a green, inclusive and more equitable recovery. The 2008 crisis was a missed opportunity. However, the post-pandemic can change that. Please sustainable time. development goals, which are at the very core of OAC's policy agenda, will help steer member states' efforts in the right policy direction. I believe that voicing the importance of multilateralism and calling for affirmative action is pivotal to the realization of SDGs. Recognizing the nexus piece, security and development, OAC should contribute to policy making at the highest level as to ensure SDGs remain a policy priority for the member states. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker on my list is Ms. Heidi Fry from Canada, followed by Mr. Ganjilev from Azerbaijan. Thank you very much. I, I just wanted to congratulate the second committee on an excellent report um, and to say that Elona really touched on all the important uh, con considerations we need to make. Um, I think, uh, as Doris said, multilateralism is what we're talking about here. COVID has made us do that. We need to understand that we must use multilateralism to deal with climate change. Everyone has talked about migration because of climate change. Everyone has discussed it, the idea that there was going to be food insecurity. We need to talk about that, how we work together to deal with food insecurity. Um, we also need to talk about the fact that we're going into a new economy. Uh, it's not going to be the old economy. We're going to shift into a new era. And we're going to have to look at how we prepare women and boys, young men, youth. I'm glad to hear we're speaking to youth on this one uh, because we need to get them into STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math so that they can be ready for this new era of economy. If they're not there, we're not going to be able to make it. But women are at the forefront of this because they are the ones who have been hurt most on this whole COVID-19. They are the lowest paid, they've lost their jobs. And I think it is time that we started looking at how 
we supported women. Economies will never do well unless we use all of our populations, men and women, to be able to build a new economy. So I wanted to thank you. I had a lot more to say, I think, but it's obviously I'm running out of time. And uh, so I wanted to thank you for an excellent report. Thank you very much, Ms. Fry. The next speaker on my list is Mr. Ganjilev from Azerbaijan, followed by Ms. Gwen Moore from the United States. Ms. Ganjilev, you have the floor. Uh, uh, dear, dear, chair, dear chairperson, uh, dear colleagues, again, it's very important to strengthen the role of the OEC in building up economic, environmental uh, security in the region, and of course, also to, um, to raise uh, the importance of the uh, science and technology in the OEC region, because if we address the problems uh, through the perspectives of economy, through the perspectives of environmental security, um, uh, new technologies. And of course, this gives additional impetus to addressing all the problematic issues, like in the South Caucasus. Uh, Azerbaijan has uh, liberated its territories from occupant forces, and now the government of Azerbaijan is mainly focused on rebuilding, reconstructing all the destroyed territories uh, during the war. And of course, uh, with the uh, help of the OEC, we would like to bring new ideas, new uh, proposals to the region, and of course, uh, again, uh, also uh, reintegrating all Armenian citizens of Azerbaijan into the political, economic, humanitarian spheres of our country. This is very important uh, from this perspective. And of course, uh, the role of OEC, again, uh, has to be mentioned, and we are looking forward to cooperate uh, with all our colleagues, especially in the platform of, the, uh, of this committee, which is doing very, very great job, and I would like to thank you all. Thank you, dear colleagues. Thank you very much for this statement. Uh, the next uh, person, uh, speaker on my list is Ms. Moore from the United States, followed by Ms. Higgins from Ireland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> COVID-19 has harmed practically everyone economically, but there are certain vulnerable populations that have been uniquely impacted by the pandemic. So-called essential workers, often ethnic minorities have faced the greatest harms. And also it's important to note that women represent 70% of the health and social care sector workforce globally, putting them at significant risk of infection in the workplace. Also women face unique economic strain and health safety risks, including the shadow pandemic of gender Gender violence, and we need to make sure that they're vaccinated and taken care of. Small businesses are particularly vulnerable at this time, and they have a very insecure supply chain, depending on places like China and Russia that often manipulate markets to get uh, mar a strategic market advantage. And I would urge uh, this parliamentary uh, assembly to be cautious about uh, making markets uh, where we have this very insecure um, uh, supply chain where uh, intellectual property, human rights, corruption and customs and data privacy breaches are the norm. Uh, we should also not want to be complicit with China uh, in their abuse of the uh, Uyghurs. Uh, and of course, when we look at uh, Nordstrom 2 projects uh, that, where Russia is using uh, their uh, energy advantage, uh, uh, we, we ought to be very cautious. And I see that my time is expiring. I'm glad to be here at the winter meeting and I yield back my time. Thank you very much, Madam Moore. The next speaker on my list is um, Ms. Higgins from Ireland, followed by Ms. Gregorian from Armenia. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you to all of the speakers. Um, I think that the COVID-19 crisis has shown us uh, our interdependence more than ever. It's highlighted also the importance of public services, of social care, uh, of access to nature, and the impact of the life and death impact of inequality, uh, including gender inequality. So many of the issues that we need to talk about in terms of the economy and environment have come into a very strong focus now. And I think it's really important that our response is not business as usual, but must be something different. And I think the, the vision that we have in the sustainable development goals, which is that integrated vision, is more needed and more necessary now than ever, and really should be a blueprint for our response. Uh, also, in terms of the just transition, which we had expected in terms of climate action, now becomes pressing and must begin right away. However, 
public-public cooperation is also crucial. And in this, we need to do better. Uh, we've seen Michael Ryan of the World Health Organization calling for more action in respect of the COVAX initiative, sharing of vaccines, and indeed the CTAP, the COVID technology access pool. We need to share uh, intellectual property and access to ensure a global response on COVID. And that sets the blueprint on climate action. Because if we do not work together, uh, if we allow a profit bottlenecks around the technology and tools to address climate change, we will face a further crisis. So again, I think there's something we can learn from this. And I think there's more that we can do to step up uh, our public public cooperation and shared investment. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Madam Higgins. The next speaker in my list is Mr. Gregorian. Please, Mr. Gregorian, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Indeed, as I'm probably one of the last speakers, I wanna say that I completely agree that we need better cooperation in economic issues and better communication. And for this, we need to resolve the conflict. However, I have to say, unfortunately, that when speaking about the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict uh, and mentioning that it's over, my colleague from the Azerbaijani delegation is wrong, unfortunately. And I wanna say that the attempt to resolve a conflict by use of force, which is a flagrant violation of principles of Helsinki Final Act, could become a very dangerous precedent for the whole OSCE region. Indeed, undermining the entire OSCE security architecture and putting it under risk. Lasting and sustainable peace in the region can be achieved only through a comprehensive resolution of the conflict, including the realization of the right of Nagorno-Karabakh people to self-determination. And I want to express gratitude to my colleagues from other delegations who have already spoken about this, and specifically to OSC chairpersonship in office, chairperson in office, Ms. Ann Lind, who noted during her yesterday's speech that the while the ceasefire announcement stopped hostilities, it hasn't resolved the longer term issue. And I wanna appreciate the OSCE chairpersonship standing firm in supporting the OSCE Minsk Group, the only internationally recognized format for resolving the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict in their effort for reaching a comprehensive resolution to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now with the agreement of the chair, I would uh, uh, like to give a floor to one of our partners who's following us who requested the floor. It's Mr. Julien Letelier from UNEP, United Nations Environmental Programme. Mr. Letelier, the floor is yours for one minute. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable delegates, dear participants, the Mediterranean Action Plan has been created 40 years ago in a region made of inequalities, tension, pressure on natural resources, but also full of opportunities high level of education, leading research institution, vibrant civil society, and partnership for regional cooperation. Under the auspices of the United Nations Environment Programme, the Barcelona Convention and its protocols gather a coalition of 21 Mediterranean countries and the European Union, most of them being represented at the Parliamentary Assembly of the OSCE. Through our recent promising dialogue with the Parliamentary Assembly of the OSCE, we want to foster our cooperation toward pro-sustainability national action and a green renaissance. We are not on track to achieve the SDGs by 2030 in the Mediterranean region, where the symptoms of the triple planetary crisis of pollution, biodiversity loss, and climate change are taking acute form. This is a message from two important publications, our State of the Environment and Development and the first Mediterranean Assessment Report prepared by MEDEC, the MED IPCC, a network of Mediterranean experts on climate and environmental change. We are standing at a historic juncture for recovering better and greener from COVID-19. Green path must be prioritized in all sectors renewable energy, water management, sustainable agriculture, fisheries and aquaculture, alternative tourism, and low emission shipping. As parliamentarians, your contribution to promoting smart investment today in a sustainable and resilient tomorrow are vital. This is a moment of trust. All the ingredients of success are in place. We have the legal framework, we have knowledge, technology, awareness, and a favorable public opinion, and we need we need all hands on deck because we are all in this together. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Le Julien. This completes the list of the speakers under this agenda item. We have six minutes left. Dear Ambassador Zugic, dear Ambassador Raunig, thank you very much for being for us. Would you like to respond briefly to what was mentioned? And maybe we start in reverse order with Ambassador Zugic. Thank you very much. Uh, just very briefly, I would appreciate very much uh, that we continue very good cooperation we have with the Parliamentary Assembly and of course from our side, uh, we would be ready to assist you and we're looking forward to our uh, continued cooperation and thanks so again, once again for allowing me today to give you the brief report of our activities. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Ambassador, very much. Uh, we really treasure our cooperation with your office. Ambassador Reinig, please. Yeah, thank you very much. It was uh, very interesting to listen to the colleagues from the Parliamentary Assembly. And as I see, we have... Uh, three imminent challenges, short and midterm, it's the recovery, rebuild and adapt to new reality uh, after COVID-19. Midterm and long-term, we have to tackle with environmental degradation and climate change. Cross-cutting is corruption, or as one of the parliamentarians, Mr. Fitzgerald said, the globalized uh, corruption as a phenomenon. I think there we need a strong cooperation between the Parliamentary Assembly and the executive structures of the OEC. We only can cope with these threats by common action and we need the Parliamentary Assembly to surmount barriers in order to ensure the necessary political will. Thank you very much for the invitation to this committee session. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your contribution and we really look forward to cooperating proactively with you over the next few years. Um, uh, as uh, many speakers also refer to our uh, rapporteur and her words, I would like to ask Elona, a rapporteur, she would also like to say a few final words. Thank you. And uh, dear ambassadors and dear colleagues, uh, I really appreciate what you said, and uh, it was also mentioned um, in uh, in uh, also in a lot of you what we have also uh, um, uh, found as very interesting and also as uh, overarching uh, issues. So, uh, healthcare and social crisis, uh, the more focus on migrant, environmental security. Um, also the uh, security uh, corridors, addressing poverty, boosting economic product productivity, multilateralism, and the importance of public services. So these are things that uh, I wanted also to stress, which definitely are also addressed uh, as also crossing uh, cross-cutting issues, but also as a, as a priorities within our report. Thank you very much. And thank you very much also uh, to you, Marco, and to all your team for the great work you have done and supporting the, our committee uh, to prepare for this, uh, uh, this event, not only. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Rapporteur. It is always our pleasure to work with you and support you. And thank you very much to both ambassadors once again for their time and their uh, inspiring words. Uh, this, Mr. Chairperson, concludes the, the debate under this agenda item, and therefore the floor is back to you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, before concluding, I first of all would like to thank to the Madam Chair, to Madam Rapporteur, to Ambassadors, because their uh, interventions were extremely effective and very, very useful. And I want to say to thank you to all our speakers for their contributions. And I think that uh, exchange of opinions was very, very effective and very useful, as always, in the second committee and in the second dimensions. Indeed, there is a plenty of work to do ahead of us, and let us not lose momentum. I look forward to seeing you at the next informa informative briefing under the label Science Informs Policymaker on the interlinkages between environmental security and COVID-19, which is tentatively planned for spring. And finally, I would like to thank to the International Secretary of that for its support in organizing today's online session, as well as all the interpreters for their excellent work today and outstanding performance. And the meeting now is closed. Thank you very much.